uh, sorry for this kind of inconvenience what already is being done <laughs> Uh, apologies. So let me talk to you on the current approaches in diagnosis and medical management of uh, renal diseases in dogs. Do I get my next uh, slide as well, or you will have to do it? Yeah. Uh, first of all, let's say what is kidney disease. To be a simpler way to talk about, it removes toxins on the blood and excrete them from the body in urine. Regulate blood pressure and the blood acidity levels. Prevent water loss on the body maintain overall healthy metabolic disease. So any condition which stops the kidneys working normally is referred to as kidney renal disease. And this can vary greatly in severity. This indicates damage in progress, but there is still functional tissue left. Whereas in renal failure, the kidneys have stopped functioning altogether and is more serious. Hello, I don't have the slide control, please. Can I go to the next slide yeah, on my own? Hello? Yeah. Now let us look at the bit of anatomy of this. Let me quickly go through all these. That doesn't need much of explanation. So kidneys on either side, the ureters, urethra, and the urinary bladder. Next, please. How do I move to the next slide, uh, Mukesh? I, I don't get the slide on. Hello? Uh, sir, we are we are following you. Yeah, you will operate. So this can. Yeah, go yeah, yeah we are operating, sir. Uh, yeah, please. With go your next, me. we are operating. Yes. Yes, because I don't have the control on this. No, no, no. Yeah. Yes, we are playing, sir. Yes. Yeah, this is a normal kidney. Look at the vessel, and this gets uh, as if in a good blood supply, but in reality, kidney gets uh, very less blood supply. Next, please. Now, this is the cross section of the kidney. If you look at that, everyone knows about it. What we are interested is the nephron, each of these functioning here, and this is the pelvis, and the artery, and the renal vein, and the ureters. Next, please. Now, what is the definition? Let us look at it. Kidney disease is defined as the presence of functional or structural abnormality, bar abnormalities in one or both the kidneys. Next, please. Acute renal failure is defined as an abrupt decrease in renal function, leading to retention of nitrogenous waste. Acute kidney could also be called as acute kidney injury, also called as AKD. That means you use the terms like AKI, ARF, and AKD. This represents a continuum of renal injury from mild, clinically inapparent nephron loss to severe acute renal failure. Next, please. A chronic kidney disease, this is defined as kidney damage that has existed for at least three months with or without decreased glomerular filtration rate. I stress upon the point. When you talk of a CKD, it means that there has been a disease process which has occurred a few months ago. This could also be called as a reduction in GFR by more than 50% from the normal persisting for at least three months. Next, please. What are the common causes of kidney disease in dogs? This is from the perspective of a practitioner, I would put it as. Number one, damage to the kidney filters. What are they? Glomerular disease. Example of this is Lyme disease and cancer. Infection of kidney tissues, which is pyelonephritis. Why I'm stressing upon this point is earlier, people used to call and treat nephritis as always a bacterial infection and think of antibiotics as an answer. So it's not so. Infections are very, very less than that. One example of that is pyelonephritis. Then next, the third most important is the kidney stone, referred to as nephrolithiasis, kidney blockage, which is the ureteral blockage, ureteral obstruction, which lead on to hydronephrosis. Next, please. Damage to the kidney tubule, which is the tubulointerstitial disease. Very specific bacterial infection, leptospirosis, which can lead on to kidney damage. Toxins, plenty of them I'll talk a little later. Neoplasms of the kidneys, amyloidosis, and hereditary conditions. I would like to highlight a little on these uh, hereditary conditions. How are they manifested? These are all referred to as most familial renal diseases. These are progressive and invariably ultimately fatal. How soon it can occur? Onset of renal failure occurs at three months to three years of age. Examples of these are renal dysplasia 
and some glomerulopathies. Onset could be as late as three years and even up to seven years of age in uh, conditions like polycystic kidney, some glomerulopathies, amyloidosis, and glomerulonephritis. Why I'm talking about this is, imagine these signs in the dogs which are presented at the clinic. Reduced appetite or anorexia, stunted growth, weight loss, polyuria, polydipsia, particularly in the age group of six months to one year, we start suspecting diabetes insipidus, but this could be a sign of renal disease. Vomiting, food hair coat, halitosis, diarrhea, pallor of the mucous membranes, oral ulceration, uremic odor. This is how they are presented. Now let us come at the specific familial nephropathies. Number one, how do we encounter all these? How do we see them? Since many of the practitioners these days are used to ultrasonography and when they go through, and obviously this is sometimes an incidental or accidental finding, renal dysplasia in Lasha Apsu, Chidzu, Wheaton Terrier, Chow Chow, primary glomerulopathies, that is English Cocker Spaniel, Bull Terrier, Dalmatian, Doberman Pinscher, Bull Mastiff, Newfoundland, Trotvila, Welsh Corgi, Beagle, and polycystic kidney disease in Bull Terriers, Kerin Terriers, West Highland uh, White Terrier, and White Terriers. Next, please. Next, please. Amyloidosis, sharp eye, English foxhound, beagle, immune mediated glomerulopathies in soft coated wheat and terrier, Bernice mountain dog, and miscellaneous conditions like the Massengi Fanconi syndrome, which is very specific in the Massengi breeds. Next, please. This is about the familia. Now, coming back to ER, the acute renal failure, this is classically divided into three categories that is, the pre renal then the renal, intrinsic, and the post-renal. Please go ahead. Pre-renal. This is pre-renal azotemia is caused by insufficient delivery of blood to the functional kidneys for adequate clearance of the solutes and the uremic toxins. Renal, pre-renal causes include plenty of them. Anything that can cause a decrease in the blood, for example, dehydration, hypovolemia, hypotension, Decreased effective circulating volume, as you could see in cardiac failure, hepatic cirrhosis, nephrotic syndromes, post anesthesia, hypoadrenocortism, trauma, surgery, shock. It could be hypovolemic, hemorrhagic, hypotensic, septic, heat stroke, hypoalbuminemia, renal hypoperfusion, that is secondary to non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, ACE, specifically used in cardiac and hepatic patients. All these become pre-renal causes where azotemia can be a feature. It is characterized by increased bun and creatinine concentrations in conjunction with a concentrated urine-specific gravity. These are important for us. So that means you do bun, creatinine, and specific gravity. Pre-renal azotemia is characterized by rapid reversal when the underlying problem is corrected. This is equally important for us. If we can correct them, then azotemia can be a totally a changed scenario on that. Next, please. Next slide, please. Intrinsic renal failure. This results from damage to any section of the kidney. It could be to the glomeruli, tubules, interstitium, or the vessels. And invariably, you can say either it is because of ischemia or toxin, which means toxemia. Infectious causes, very specifically, both bacterial pyelonephritis and leptospirosis can cause intrinsic renal failure. Bacterial pyelonephritis is usually caused by the ascending infection in the lower urinary tract, but infection may be even hematogenous in origin. Predisposing conditions for the development of pyelonephritis include bacterial endocarditis, discospondylitis, and as well as pyometra. Leptospirosis is another disease causing acute renal failure. Next, please. Intrinsic, the much more important is the nephrotoxicants. Plenty of them. One is the ethylene glycol, and more commonly, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs used for various reasons, maybe DJDs or muscular pains, used over a period without knowing what the side effects of them are. The most common is the NSAID itself. Even cholecalcif are all being used for quite a large number of breeds of dogs in order to regulate the probably the musculoskeletal disorders or 
but you can talk to them as skeletal anomalies or re skeletal remodeling. Aminoglycosides, gentamicin, lucky that not many people use gentamicin, but if there's a situation like a urea and you use gentamicin and frosamide together, I think that's the best way to kill an animal, I would say, and is it not to be taken for granted. Less common, tetracyclines of late, probably a lot many people would use uh, tetracycline when I talk of oxytetracycline when used for treatment of Ehrlichia for a longer period, like two to three weeks or four weeks, can definitely damage, though certain drugs are safer, not all of them are safer. Doxy may be safer. Cisplatin, amphotericine being used in fungal diseases, could be a nephrotoxicant. Postrenal, this is urine leakage or urinary obstruction caused by urethral obstruction. Bilateral urethral obstructions or unilateral with a solitary functional kidney can lead on to a severe situation of postrenal azotemia. Next, please. Grapes and resins are the worst when you talk in terms of renal disorders. These are a contrarian case of dogs, particularly with CKD. Even otherwise, it is said, avoid them because these make the animals prone for kidney disorders. Next, please. What is chronic renal failure? This is the most commonly recognized form of a kidney disease in dog and cat. Their kidney lesions are typically characterized by permanent reduction in the number of functioning nephrons. Regardless of the underlying cause, CKD may be characterized as an irreversible and slowly progressive disease. Please underline, irreversible and slowly progressive disease. Whereas no treatment can correct existing irreversible kidney lesion of the CKD, Clinical and biochemical consequences of the reduced kidney function can often be managed with supportive therapy. This is the most important thing in CKD. What are the congenital causes of CKD? As we said earlier, amyloidosis, renal dysplasia, polycystic kidney, glomerulopathy, and Fanconi syndrome, particularly in the Besson G breeds of dogs. Acquired, these are infections, metabolic causes, obstructive neuropathy, neoplasms, proteinary kidney disease like amyloidosis and glomerulopathies, sequelae of any acute renal failure could lead on to a CKD, chronic nephrotoxin exposures, immune-mediated uh, diseases, renal ischemia, and lastly, we say idiopathic. All these could lead on to that. In dogs, acute loss of two-thirds or more of functional nephrons is associated with loss of adequate urine concentrating ability whereas acute loss of three-fourths or more of functional nephrons results in azotemia. So it means azotemia is a laboratory finding with several fundamentally different causes. Azotemia should not be used as a synonym for kidney disease or uremia is one another fundamental thing that we need to live on. Chronic in the context of CKD means an irreversible and usually progressive loss of kidney function. In contrast, Acute kidney injury is potentially reversible either by resolution of at least part of the kidney injury or development of adaptive compensatory enhancements in kidney function or a combination of both of this. So acute renal failures are much better to treat than the chronic kidney diseases. Glomerular filtration rate is one of the most common thing accepted as the best overall measure of the kidney function in health. Serum creatinine remains the most commonly used estimate of GFR in dogs, cats, and humans. I would say either two. But now what is the better way? The better way could be a SDMA. Bun never has been used as a parameter earlier. It is particularly important to consider the pet's ability to concentrate urine adequately. That is, a urine-specific gravity of more than 1030 in dogs and 1035 to 1040 in cats when interpreting serum creatine in concentrations. You should use both together. Studies indicate that the rate of disease progression correlates with the amount of proteinuria and a therapy designed to reduce proteinuria retards progression. Why I'm talking about this point is when we talk of proteinuria, there is loss of protein, there is hypoalbuminemia. Hypoalbuminemia will result in weight loss in the animal. 
So that is the reason why if there is a continuous protein loss, it has to be managed very well. Similarly, generalized progressive interstitial disease initially caused by the bacteria, eventually destroys tubules and glomeruli and stimulates inflammation and fibrosis. When the fibrosis has occurred, you know very well there is no regeneration capacity in the kidney tissues. Regardless of the initiating cause, replacement of the majority of the damaged nephrons with collagenous connective tissue results in the overall reduction in the kidney size and impaired renal function. This is the ultimate impact. So that's the reason why you should take care of that. Now let us look at the diagnostic techniques that we have quickly. Let us go through that. Laboratory evaluation, renal function, radiography, renal biopsy. Yes, please go ahead. Go ahead. Exploratory laparotomy, quantitation of urinary enzymes, endoscopy, scintigraphy. Yes, please. And then CT scan, MRI, cystometrogram, and urodynamic studies. These are all available for us. Now let us come back to each one of them. Clinical signs. What are the most common clinical signs? Let me quickly go through this. Polyuria, polydipsia, earliest. Lots of GIT symptoms. Many a time the cases are presented with anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and maybe stomatitis, halitosis, diarrhea. And one would say, why should we suspect it to be a renal failure? You need to, melina, hematogenia. Then the second group, weight loss, muscle wasting, hypothermia, lethargy, weakness, muscle tremors, uremic pericarditis, pneumonitis, hypertension, altered behavior, renal osteodystrophy, and hemorrhagic diathesis. Many a times you find these petechial hemorrhages on the skin. You should start suspecting a renal disorder. CKD is the most common cause for elevated blood pressure. Organ systems most commonly affected by the elevated blood pressure include the eyes, kidney, nervous system, and the cardiovascular system. Next, please. These are the typical oral ulcers. Because of uremia, you can see that bleeding point. Again, on the palate. Next, please. And then, Go ahead. Stingy saliva, which is a blood tinged discharge, and you can make out all these ulcers and the stingy or ropey saliva, which comes out of that. These are uremic symptoms. Rubber jaws, altered way of the configuration of the mouth itself. And if you make a photo x ray of them, at least the x ray of that would uh, look much, much different. Than that. Go ahead, please. This is the x ray wherein you can see the osseous tissue being uh, the calcium not being there and rubbery in, uh, in nature. Next, please. When you look at the kidney as such, probably you start from the normal from here. This is the intrinsic injury function. There's a structural damage, a kidney failure. So you have stages. Stage one in CKD, if it is a recovery like this, CKD stage two to four, damage would occur and is the death. So if you are looking at an ultrasonographic picture of them, obviously one can make out that these are all in the different stages of them. Next, please. Laboratory evaluation. You look for azotemia, which is elevated burn and creatinine by a usual biochemical parameter, hyperpaspatemia, metabolic acidosis, hypokalemia, and hypo or hyperkalemia, anemia. These are the prominent features in the laboratory when you talk of this. So you take a blood sample or a serum sample, look for mean parameters are these one, creatinine, phosphorus, and then calcium, sodium, and also potassium being done. And in the hematology, get the RBC and hemoglobin and PCB. These are the most important for monitoring that. Urine analysis, many a time, this has uh, probably left many practitioners because many do not consider this much easier, probably because you need to go in for a urine collection, catheterization, do's and don'ts, good and bad, many a times. And if you tell the owner and the contaminated urine samples, et cetera, et cetera. But what is that minimum that you need to do is you can use a TS meter, the total solids meter, and check for the specific gravity. Specific gravity, the urine is a good indicator. Then check for the albumin, proteinuria, liquiduria, sediment, centrifuge, a 15 ml urine sample, and uh, take the sediment and look under the microscope for the cash, RBCs, WBCs, bacteria, etc. And crystalluria, calcium oxalate crystals, and sometimes you might need a urine culture. This is very simpler. We let me not talk too much on that. But these are very necessary. Please incorporate in the renal section when you're working to do the urine analysis as a minimum parameter.
Next, please. These are the cells and cas. Many will have seen all these photographs, like starting from the renal epithelial cells, the WBCs, the RBCs, all of them, and bacterial, you can see in the cells in the urine. And this is the cellular cas, the hyaline cas, and the crystals of different, you can look at them, but many photographs are available for this. Next, please. And these are all a good indication of that. And these are all uh, calcium oxalate, dehydrate, ethylene glycol poisoning. You find these kind of microphotographs. And particularly when you put the urine sedimented sample into the low part of the microscope, is a good indication to say that you are treating cases of either nephrolithiasis or urolithiasis, uh, systolith, et cetera, et cetera. Certain types of drugs, they can produce all these kinds of crystals. You define them. And this can happen when there's a patient is on a long-term sulfa therapy. Next, please. Now let's come back to the laboratory variation, which I said earlier, metabolic acidosis, hyperphosphatemia, et cetera, et cetera. And you could also talk of biopsies very specifically when you want to establish a very specific cause, particularly when it is because of hereditary disorder. Next, please. How do we go ahead about this? These are the minimum hematological values. Let me not highlight all these. You know very well, dog and cat, you will get it in my notes. Next, please. And uh, go for. This is the normal serum chemistry. I've highlighted some of them. In the red, that is, get the bicarbonate, calcium, creatinine, and you get the phosphorus, potassium, sodium, and bloody renin. These are the basic parameters that you should ask for when monitoring the kidney patients or the renal patient. This is another important, uh, which you probably all these uh, days people are not using ECG as a routine, but now you can use them. Why I talk about this is, this is a normal ECG, what you can make out a pictorial way, and this is the representation of it. You can easily see a P wave, a QRST, and a T wave. This is a normal ECG. Now let us look at a patient with renal problem. Go ahead, please. The next one is particularly <coughs> when you talk of hyperkalemia, excess of potassium being there, you can make out when you are doing this, this is a lead to, you can look at there is no P wave, you have a QRS wave, you have a T wave, no P, QRS. So absence of P wave associated with the clinical sign, coupled with the hematology and biochemistry before you can get it, can definitely say that there is hyperkalemia associated with renal disorder. And this can definitely help for us on the table because many of them use the monitors when you do your fluid therapy. Next, please. Similarly, you could also use the prolonged QT interval, and this is seen with hypocalcemia. You can see the QT intervals, and please, next, go ahead. And QT interval, if it is more than 0 0.04, you can talk about hypokalemia. Radiographs may demonstrate normal to enlarged kidneys and or nephrolis bar peritoneolis. You can definitely do an X-ray for calculi. Abdominal ultrasound may show a normal or enlarged kidney. Many a times, abdominal ultrasounds, particularly when you're doing it, you can identify the, the fibrosis which has occurred to say that how bad the kidneys. Similarly, you could also see bands between the corticomedullary junctions in cases of leptospirosis. So X-rays and ultrasound could also be helpful. Biopsy. A renal biopsy is very beneficial, particularly when you're talking about the nephrotoxicants and similarly in lymphosarcoma, leptospirosis, etc. Let me go through the procedure of this, how to do this. Go ahead, please. And people are using biopsy needles, a true cut biopsy needle. Next, please. You can use a true cut biopsy needle and do this. Go ahead, please. This is a needle. This is a core biopsy needle, which is a true cut. Let me look at this. This is, you can see the space there, and there's a sheath coming out. This is the sheath which is covered over there. Next, please. Go ahead, please. This is how the true principle is when you, in, this is a sheath. First, you introduce this needle, and when you pierce this through the sheath, this is the needle with a slot for the specimen, and then push the needle into the lesion. This is the guide way and slide the sheath over the needle. You are using the sheath over there and you get the tissue into the spot. So withdraw the needle and this is the correct and incorrect methodologies. This is the correct method and this is the incorrect method. Please hold on for a while. 
please hold on back back please and what is most important please go back to the previous slide if you can and what is important is if you are doing this you are into the artery this can cause hemorrhage and death and now when you are doing this you might say am i taking the right lesion this is again this is one of the disadvantage of a biopsy but you can use a ultrasound guided biopsies can be done where you can identify the lesion and then can direct your needle onto that point and can collect so we can uh, what we want is the cortico medullary this is the nephron areas what we want is more from the cortex rather than from the medulla next please exploratory laparotomy ct scan mri excretory urography measurement of gfr let me leave all these because these are all more academic and not for a day to day practitioner go to the next slide please and now more important is for example this is the pale sunken firm kidney with a pitted surface this is a scarring and uh, probably you can think of all these lesions when you are doing it by an ultrasound you can get it next please new strategies serum creatinine is readily available this is considered as an creatinine is an insensitive marker for mild renal dysfunction then what is the better cystatin c or the disease process so you can talk about cystatin c which is better but this cannot be done by a very laboratory and the point here is cystatin c rises much earlier to the creatinine in the renal disease what is that important for us please go ahead this is pretty important for us what how can we do that best thing is go in for the urine biomarkers quantitation of these may provide information on early renal damage blood biomarkers these again help in early detection of the renal disease now let us look at them what are those markers but please ideal biomarkers for kidney injury you have plenty of them kidney specific biomarkers able to detect kidney injury they isolate the kidney cause of kidney injury specific to particular sites easily reliably and promptly and non invasively measurable stable in its matrix and supposed to be considered as inexpensive to measure but all the time no what are these these are the biomarkers for the acute injuries and these are for the chronic so this is in gal neutrophil gelatinase associated uh, lipocalin interleukin interleukin kidney injury molecule cystatin c being used these many of them are not yet available but when you come to the chronic you have the n gal again which is for both acute and chronic and now what is more important is people started using adm earlier but now currently sdma that is the symmetric dimethyl arginine is being used as a marker for kidney damage both in case of acute renal failure as well as chronic renal failure kidney function you can talk in terms of cystatin t tubular interstitial injury you can use nag glomerular injury podocin endothelial dysfunction you can use sdma oxidative stress you can use the ggt inflammation you can talk of crp and interleukins and fibrosis this is the tumor growth factor b1 can be used so these are the ways and now we have this pattern the statin t being used by some of the academic institutions it is produced at a constant rate in all tissues and its excretion is not dependent on age gender and diet it is a marker of gf gfr and the levels are 0.5 to 1.5 mg per dl in serum of normal dogs so if it is elevated you can say that hey, there is an inflammation it could also be seen in neoplasia of the kidneys this is a good marker as compared to one and creatinine the other thing being the novel biomarkers of nephrotoxicity are nag gst ggt aap ldh these are urinary enzymes not done on the serum so you should remember that these are quantitative in the urine not in the blood sample for that at least no let us look at why this bun and creatinine levels rise when 75% of the tissue is damaged that means we have left with only 25% whereas urinary enzymes when you talk up they usually rise by day 7 as compared to day 10 for creatinine level so obviously you can say if you are using urinary enzymes you can detect much earlier as compared to bun and creatinine maybe one week earlier and you can say maybe it's at around 60% of the damage rather than at 75% of the damage please go to the next please now these are the urine enzymes and let me quickly go through these are all these can be done next please 
and uh, being done in the laboratories where the academic interest of these, where college uh, hospitals can do this. This is a normal level for alkaline phosphate, GGT, LDH, NAG. This is normal animal, non-azotemic animal, azotemic animals. So these are good enough and you can detect them early. And NAG, the normal levels are 6.2 units per gram of creatine. You are comparing them and you get plenty of all these values in the node. So since we are not regularly using it, let me skip from the point of a practitioner. Next, please. Next, please. Go ahead. Proteinuria. This is one ideal, I would say. Many have uh, left this, taking that, talking about urine protein by simple tests are not good. These are predictor of the CKD progression. Screening for early detection, he called it a microalbuminuria. These days, people have the microalbuminuria kits being made available. Urine albumin concentration, 1 to 30 mg per deciliter. And severity may be assessed by measuring a 24-hour urine protein excretion. And you can also talk of urine protein versus urine creatinine ratio. Normal values, again, for 24 hours, if it is less than 20 mg per kg per day, is normal, it's different, then you can say there's a kidney damage. So you can also do urine protein versus urine creatinine ratios, and these are less than 0.4 as a ratio, which is normal. If there's an alteration, then you can say the kidney disease is setting in. Next, please. This is a simple total solids meter available to everybody. You just need to put a drop of urine here. You can record both specific gravity as well as to some extent the total protein if it is in grams. If it is in milligrams, you cannot detect. You can go in for the estimations. SDMA, this is the most popular of late, very popular. This is eliminated primarily by the glomerular filtration and it's not affected by the tubular reabsorption. Therefore, it can be used as an intrinsic GFR marker. Elevation of SDME, more than 14 microgram per deciliter in dogs, is about 17 months before serum creatinine exceeds its reference range. That means you can imagine, if you are depending on creatinine, you are assessing at 75% damage. When you talk of SDME, you are assessing at 10% damage, and it can be as early as 17 months. This is a good parameter, I would say, and probably people can depend on this very well. And the cutoff point that you use is 14 mcg per deciliter. Next, please. Let me a little more of a staging of CKD based on SDMA because everybody talks of SDMA these days, days. A little about CAT, let me leave that. In stage one, it is less than 18, stage two, 18 to 35, stage three, 36 to 54, and stage four, more than 54. When you come to the interpretation, dehydrated dog or cat with the SDMA of 16 mg per deciliter and a urine specific gravity of more than 104 likely has prerenal azotemia. That means this is the RF, and we say prerenal. So look at the specific gravity. Acute renal failures, hyper, hyperesthenuria means specific gravity is more. Whereas chronic kidney disease, specific gravity is low, many times less than 1010. It could also come down to 1006 or 7, where you call it as isostenuria. Elevation of SDMA more than 14 accompanied by an isostenuric UCAG, even if serum creatine levels are less than 1.4 mg deciliter, it indicates CKD. That means you can have a picturization for both AKD and CKD combining with specific gravity of the urine versus the biochemical parameter SDMA. Next, please. Urine protein to creatinine ratio, dogs and cats, less than 0.2. We call it as non proteinuric. 0.2 to 0.5, borderline. More than 0.5, proteinuric. So, this is a condition to say that these animals would need additional supplementation of protein when you say proteinuria. Next, please. Blood pressure monitoring, less than 150, normotensive, 150 to 159, borderline hypertensive, hypertensive rather, 160 to 179, hypertensive, and more than 180, severely hypertensive. So this would definitely help us in what we should put them under treatment on that. Dogs and cats with borderline serum creatinine or SDMA should be retested. How? Oh, two weeks after initial testing to confirm the initial value, then monitor every three months to assess the renal function. People will ask a question, how often we do an SDMA? So do it every three months so that you can say you may can make an early detection of renal failure. Next, please. This is the International Renal Interest Society grading of uh, acute kidney 
grading grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 grade 4 and grade 5 all of you know the values and the critical being grade 4 anything beyond 5 because in humans anything beyond 5 goes for a hemodialysis whereas up to grade 3 are managed by fluid administration and this is very critical and grade 5 more than 10 i am sure you would have come across you'll also agree with me as practitioners day 1 you would have seen values of 12 14 16 18 even 25, I've seen the highest being 28 in my clinical practice on a day one serum evaluation of creatinine. Where they fit in really cannot fit in anywhere in this. Next, please. Now, treatment of AKI. I think this is what, where we all would like to highlight more on this. Treatment yeah, yeah, yeah. limiting further yeah. renal damage okay. and enhancing cellular recovery. Treatment is most successful during the induction and extension phases. And okay. since the phone is on, please. Treatment is most successful during the induction and extension phases, and success diminishes once the later phases have been reached. The most effective therapy of AKI is careful management of fluid balance. This is most important. What is important in AKI? Don't think of a drug first. It is pre-renal. So you need to treat the pre-renal cause, and fluid therapy becomes a great idea. Please go ahead. Fluid therapy. What is that we need to start? A balanced polyionic solution. Lactate ring solution is appropriate in most situations. Physiological saline, 0.9% contains no potassium because we talked about hyperkalemia. There's a reason why infuse a fluid without potassium and is suitable when treating hyperkalemia. Fluids low in sodium are more appropriate after rehydration. What do you talk of half saline? Determine the volume. What is the volume to be given? The volume of rehydration is calculated from the formula body weight in kg into estimated percentage of hydration is equal to the fluid deficit in liters and then talk of the maintenance fluid therapy commonly regarded as 66 ml per kg per day. The volume is varies based on the clinical situation like if there is a vomit or a diarrhea or there is any kind of a fluid accumulation. A new patient should receive fluids to replace insensible losses only and not the other losses. So you need to really calculate. What is the way you can calculate and what should be the idea? You can start ARF with mannitol and this can be administered as a slow IV bolus. When I say bolus, single administration, 0.2 by to one gram per kg, calculate and do with that. Then hypertonic dextrose can be used as an osmotic diuretic if, if mannitol is not a man. What is hypertonic dextrose? You can use 20% dextrose solution. A total dilute dose of 20 to 60 ml per kg of a 20% dextrose solution should cause hyperglycemia and glucosuria. If this is occurring, it's a good indication that you are reversing the kidney damage. And if the kidney can eliminate the glucose or you have administered and the urine is positive for glucose, it's a good indicator to follow the treatment. Use the loop diuretics. You can use the ferrosamide. This can increase the urine flow without increasing the GFR. In certain times, people also use probably dopamines. I'll talk about dopamine a little later. I don't want to put people into lots of probably confusion or issues on that. Despite the increase in the urine output, loop diuretics do not improve the outcome. Frusomide should not be given in patients with aminoglycoside induced acute uremia. That means if they are on gentamicin therapy or any kind of glycoside, aminoglycosides, please do not use frusomide. It can damage the kidney. Next, please. Okay, sorry. An increase in the urine output should be apparent 20 to 60 minutes after an IV frosamide dose of 2 to 6 milligram per kg. If there is no response to high doses, therapy should be discontinued with this. Please do not keep on increasing frosamide. If a response does occur, this dose can be administered every 6 to 8 hours. I am talking about acute renal failure, not CKD. Renal replacement therapy is the treatment of choice for patients that fail to respond to medical management. We will talk about renal replacement therapy a little later. Next, please. What is the renal replacement therapy? Intractable hyperkalemia, life-threatening volume overload, persistent uremic symptoms are indications for renal replacement therapy. What is that you can talk of? Peritoneal dialysis is rarely used for critically ill people, but is more readily available for animal than hemodialysis or hypopetration. This is for ARF. Peritoneal dialysis, it has its own disadvantages, which we'll talk a little later. Next, please. 
extra corporeal replacement therapy includes intermittent hemodialysis and continuous renal replacement therapy i think we should go for that hello hello yes sir yeah i don't know i got disconnected i think okay let me go through here i think we were here okay i don't know i i'm audible isn't it But yes sir yeah you are audible sir my presentation is going on yes sir yes yes yes, yes sir yes sir. but i am not getting the slides i am not getting the slides next slide so it is it is visible next next right i am not getting the slides this one is the next sir uh you are not getting i know it's not visible to me i am showing renal replacement therapy Yeah, but well, let me see what is here. But I lost the, I lost the. Vishal sir, you just uh, stop sharing and uh, please share one once again. What is talking about renal replacement? Huh? You are getting it, but I am not getting the slides. One minute. Now can you see? I think got it now. Okay. Yes, sir. Got it. Yeah, I got it now. Yeah. Now got it. Okay, renal replacement. Both. Will you go back to the previous one? Go back to the previous slide once, please. Yeah. So what you need to do is ART removes uremic toxins from the blood uh, stream by diffusion under convention. Please go ahead. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. Both IHD and CRT required vascular access, and there are many methodologies, and you can go by this. Let me not talk too much about it. Please go ahead. Go ahead with this. you get catheters now come to the specific treatment certain causes of acute uremia have specific treatment penicillin or doxycycline is used to treat leptospirosis pyelonephritis can be treated by we know very well it's a gram negative bacteria chloroquinolones have good spectrum against gram negative organisms and have a good renal tissue penetration so the antibiotic of choice are ampicillin amoxy amoxiclavulanic acid spevulosporin these are all pretty effective in treating these gram negative infection next please Aminoglycoside acid should be avoided because of their potential for nephrotoxicity. Urinary alkalization is recommended for sulfonamide toxicity and pigment uh, nephropathy. And maintenance of high urine flow rates with mannitol and high volume fluid therapy may also be beneficial. At least now treating complications. What are these? Hyperkalemia is the most important. Renal excretion is the major mechanism for removing the potassium from the body. Hyperkalemia has to be treated. It can be life threatening. So how can you treat them? Calcium gluconate, ten percent, point five to one ml per kg IV to the effect, even slowly. This has to be used uh, to restore the cardiac membrane excitability, but it doesn't decrease the potassium concentration. So in combination of complications, when you want this hyperkalemia, insulin can be administered, point five units per kg as an effect within twenty to thirty minutes. But when you use the insulin, there can be hypoglycemia. So use insulin and dextrose. Dextrose as one to two gram per unit insulin. as an iv bolus then 1 to 2 gram per unit insulin and iv fluids administered over the next 4 to 6 hours is necessary to prevent hypoglycemia when insulin is used so this is the treatment for hyperkalemia when you talk in addition correction of metabolic acidosis with bicarbonate allows an intracellular shift of potassium as the bicarbonate is combined with the uh, h is combined with the bicarbonate and removed the dose of sodium bicarbonate to treat hyperkalemia is based on the calculation of the base deficit if ideally dose can be 1 to 2 milli equivalents per kg iv over 10 to 20 minutes and maybe you could also think of peritoneal or hemodialysis may be necessary ultimately to control potassium if oliguria or anuria is present so hyperkalemia needs to be addressed anemia is the other complication seen with acute uremia because of the gi bleeding repeated blood sampling dilution associated with the polymer packed rbc transfusion is preferred to the whole blood if the pet is uh, volume overloaded and are oliguric so how do we do this so 
anemia can be treated by uh, different ways of that. Blood transfusion is an answer for that. Fluids low on, in sodium are more appropriate after rehydration. A determination is the volume to be administered involves consideration of variety of factors. Go ahead, please. And now, how do we calculate this? The volume of uh, fluid, I talked about it earlier, 60 ml, 66 ml per kg, you can calculate and use this fluid. Go ahead, please. Next. Next, please. I talked about it. In patients with signs of consistent with chronic or recurrent dehydration, long-term subcutaneous fluid therapy may also be considered. You can you administer fluid subcutaneously, not necessarily always as IV. Next, please. Subcutaneous fluid therapy can be administered in this fashion. You can put it on the wither area and uh, to the extent of 300, 500 ml can be administered in this. You are aware of the subcutaneous edema. Be careful, be cautious not to cause any kind of subcutaneous infections. Next, please. Urine volume. The importance of the monitoring the urine output is very important. Urine production in a healthy animal is 1 to 2 ml per kg per hour. So you need to consider this. A decrease in the volume, urine volume may represent an appropriate renal response to hypovolemia or a pathologic change in renal function. AKI may also result in polyuria more than 2 ml per kg per hour. So you should consider polyuria and then treat these patients. Next, please. Hemodialysis. These are the machines available. People are using it these days. And you know how to set them. And uh, dialysis machines are available for reasonably good price these days. Only point is you can make out all these lines, what you have. If you have to do it for a small dog, because very difficult. This is the artificial kidney. These are all the fluid, uh, the machinery, tubings. This tubing alone will take around 250 ml of blood. So if you have a small dog, half a liter, uh, 300 to 400 ml of blood will remain in the extra vascular system. So you need to be careful and you should use infant tubes rather than the adult tubes on this. Next, please. Go ahead. Treating complications. We talked about it. Let me go to the next one. I talked about it. Go to the next slide, please. We talked about metabolic acidosis already. Please go ahead. Potassium citrate can be used 40 to 75 milligram per kg per hour every 12 hours. This can also be used for treating metabolic acidosis and hypokalemia. Oral soda bicar can be used at the rate of 8 to 12 mg per kg orally every 12 hours. Could be useful in treating acidosis. Yes, please. Hypertension. This is a common complication of both acute and chronic renal failure. Treatment is indicated if the systolic blood pressure is over 180 millimeter per mercury. And these are all standard dosages of all these compounds. That is, amlodipine can be used. If the immediate control of hypertension is necessary, you can use hydralazine at the rate of 2.5 milligram per cat per orally or once 0.5 to 3 milligram per kg in case of dogs is used in treatment of hypertension. Next, please. You could also use uh, SE inhibitors like the enalapril and venazapril in dogs and cats. Both the dosages are all again typical. 0.25 to 0.5 mg per kg given orally every 12 to 14 hours. Dosage can be ad adjusted based on the response of that. It could also, amlodipine can go up to a dosage of starting at the initial dose of 0.1 to 0.2. It can go to 0.6 mg per kg daily. Next, please. GA complications like uh, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, you can use histamine blockers. Antiemetics are frequently needed. Gastric protectants like uh, sucralfate may also be administered to treat the GI complications. So what are the medicines available for us? Pametidine, ranitidine, omeprazole, pantoprazole, metoclopramide, sucralfate, misoprostol. The dosages are all mentioned. I don't want to go into that. You will get the notes of that. Then uh, currently people are uh, happy and uh, happy to use preparations like maropitin, which is one milligram per kg. These are all available these days. Ondansetron. 0.1 milligram per kg every 12 to 24 hours to prevent nausea and vomiting sensations. Let's go to the chronic renal failure. CKD is the most commonly recognized form of the kidney disease. And these are all a sequelae of uh, ARF. Many times we talked about it. And uh, let me not go into the, the, the etiology again and again. Go to the next slide, please. In dogs, we talked about this acute loss of this two thirds of the tissue. We will go to the treatment part. Next, please. Go to the next slide, please. Next, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. Now let's come to the IRI staging. What is being talked about is in CKD, stage one is less than 0 0.1, 0 0.4. Stage two is 1.4 to 2. 
and P is 2.1 to 5, and uh, stage 4 is more than 5. Next, please. <coughs> Studies indicate that the rate of disease progression correlates the amount of protein urea. So you need to combine this with uh, renal protein and uh, probably these are all in glomerular nephritis. So generalized progress to interstitial disease initially caused by bacteria eventually destroys the tubules and glomeruli and stimulates the inflammation and fibrosis. That's a typical feature in case of CKD. Next, please. Word, next, please. Clinical signs of CKD, polyuria and polydipsia, all these GI symptoms, weight loss, all almost the same. And uh, go ahead, we talked about it. Next, please. Laboratory findings, similar to them. Go ahead. We don't need to repeat them because we need treatment. Let's come to the treatment part of it. So it generally includes specific therapy, prevention and treatment of complication or decreased uh, kidney function and management of comorbid conditions. Unfortunately, a renal diagnosis amenable to specific therapy is not obtained for many patients. This is a real challenge. Treatment is directed at complications of decreased kidney function. This is what is called as conservative medical management. It consists of supportive and symptomatic therapy designed to correct deficits and excesses in fluid, and similarly, excess on the imbalance of electrolyte, correction of the acid base, correction of the endocrine disorder, and a nutritional. This is what you should aim at on that. And also should think of concurrent drug usage because drug accumulation in patients with reduced kidney function is primarily a result of reduced renal drug clearance. So you need to make the adjustments with the drugs that you use if they are not cleared by the urine output. Next, please. Now, dehydration. Very much similar. In patients with signs of consistent with chronic or recurrent dehydration, you go in for a fluid therapy and in long term, subcutaneous fluid therapy may be considered when it is difficult to access the vein. Next, please. Hypertension, we talked in uh, ERF, with very similar to ERF, so let me not repeat that again. Go ahead. And now anemia. This can be talked off in both ways of that, and the packet transfusion is definitely better, but how best we can manage this anemia? Please go ahead. You can talk in terms of a therapeutic course with uh, H2 receptor antagonist and sacrophate may considered for J bleeding, oral supplementation with ferrous sulfate, 100 to 300 mg per day for dogs and a transfusion of packet cells or the whole blood may be needed in severe anemia. So you can go ahead with that. And when you call for the transfusion, maybe you need to go in for a compatibility testing. And if it is possible, you could also do a biological test wherein you have the donors and infuse a 10 to 20 ml, wait for 15 minutes. If there are no reactions, you can go ahead with the first transfusion many a times. And if there are Definitely consider a dog about 25 kg because blood collection becomes easier. Otherwise, collection becomes very difficult. You have the ACT bottles available. Otherwise, many times people use sodium citrate, but you need to be worried about the citrate toxicity. People also use heparin, and you also should be worried about bleeding if excess quantity of heparin being used in the collection process. Next, please. Now, currently, for treatment of uh, secondary anemias, you get preparations. There is erythropoietin. And uh, these are very good for treatment of anemia. So you get many preparations. Just made a mention, please don't go by the trade names of that because some of them are available like this, hence the name. You need to use 50 to 150 units per kg subcutaneously three times weekly. You get 2,000 units and 4,000 units and accordingly you can adjust the dosage. And uh, you can start them at 100 units per kg and go into 150 mg, 150 units per kg. That is with erythropoietin. Currently, Darby poetin is equally available. This is a modified form of EPO, and it extends its duration of activity, whereas there you'll have to use it at uh, once in three days, whereas this can be used at weekly intervals. And the dose for uh, dogs is 0.5 to 0.8 microgram per kg, and they are available as 40 microgram per ml. So you can make a dose adjustment is much easier with Darby poetin as compared to erythropoietin. Next, please. Anemia can be treated like this. Calcium and phosphorus. So you can use the calcitriol. Should be provided a dose of two to three nanogram per kg every 24 hours for renal secondary hyperparathyroidism. And calcitriol is available and it is available as a capsule and you need to adjust the dosage and use it orally. Phosphate binders are very important in hyperphosphatemia. These include aluminum, 
calcium and lanthanum salts but please and these preparation can be used these are oral phosphate binders can be added when enteral feeding is started go ahead and the preparations are like these aluminum hydroxide or aluminum carbonate 30 to 90 mg per kg per day divided with meals calcium acetate 60 to 90 mg per kg per day and uh, calcium carbonate can be used in the same dosage calcium carbonate can be combined with chitosan and uh, one of the preparation available probably is this epic epic epicitin and people talk to them as intestinal or uh, gi dialysis because the chitosan absorbs the phosphorus and this is nothing like a peritoneal dialysis or anything it is a phosphate binder next please and uh, the question now is treatment how do we treat and uh, antibiotics anti inflammatory drugs these do not become a good way and uh, what we talk about is is the renal protectants herbal preparations and supplements plenty are available now some of the preparations are all these like renal plus rubinol azodil epigaitin many of them are available as nutraceuticals which can improve the function or alter the blood urea nitrogen levels or the creatinine levels by absorbing certain of them are the bacteria certain of them are the herbal preparations they modify the renal function and they have been proven to be much better and i can easily say as a practitioner because when i am practicing interest is the kidney disorders been using it the levels definitely come down much much earlier as compared to without their supplementation fluid therapy all other management combined with this is definitely good diet plays a major role reduced protein phosphorus and sodium content however not enough protein in the diet can be equally detrimental and protein malnutrition can occur in renal failure cases and you need to supplement with more vitamins b vitamins are very necessary a neutral effect on the acid base balance supplementation of omega 3 polyunsaturated fatty acids are equally good enough addition of uh, antioxidants are equally good and when you talk of the diet probably to make a diet uh, becomes very difficult so commercial diets which are uh, probably prescription diets play a major role here and definitely they have helped in managing lot many cases of ckd next please and commercial renal diet versus the homemade diet when you talk of maybe these are uh, highly debatable when you talk of you prepare a homemade diet but how good you are in preparing the diet how to make them palatable when we say no protein no chicken no meat no egg and how do we prepare a diet with good amount of protein because protein has to be balanced so here is the place where commercial diets play a role and obviously i would say not because that i am a promoter of any company but because they prefer the palatability is much better as compared to a homemade diet in renal patients it can be either a dry food or a semi solid food it could be a liquid diet particularly in enteral feeding where you have to go in for oral tubing and then put them on treatment you can do that as well go ahead please now let's come to the crux of this what is the prognosis in the kidney failure in ckd patients this is based on a survey report on that median survival time if you have a case of stage 1 the prognosis when you talk of this the survival time could be more than 400 days stage 2 200 to 400 days stage 3 110 to 220 days and if you are typically in a stage 4 it can be 14 to 18 days this is based on days of these and if you intervene and can prolong their life with all kinds of intervention i'm sure you will have achieved success and probably that really really brings in a feather in the cap of the practitioners otherwise many a time ckds become failure cases and they succumb and the life span cannot be increased at all so you need to intervene and think of this keeping this in mind next slide please there are certain issues uh, when you talk uh, because earlier lectures when i have done people have asked lots of question on dopamine use of uh, acetyl cysteine use of amino acids in the treatment please keep the slide for a while i want to just talk for a minute on these and then move on dopamine uh, people have been using it say that it's very wonderful in treatment of renal failure literature clearly says that dopamine is useful in preventing the anoxia or the ischemia being produced in a tissue when you are doing a contrast radiography and the real cases how much it can help is a question mark it is combined with the flusamide and done in acute renal patients and to some extent maybe they are useful but not that it is a wonderful drug but in every case it's going to bring in issues and that similarly use of n acetyl cysteine particularly on the use of these drugs not many 
government, a lot many work has been done. It has been very controversial. People have been using that 600 MG as a total oral dosage, 1,200 MG in uh, divided doses. This is only a fact in terms of increasing the creatinine value. That's all. But not that when you, uh, there, there have been a lot of studies done with uh, creatinine and cystatin C. This brings down the creatinine levels, but there has been never reduction when I say significant reduction in the cystatin C level. That means it doesn't prevent the further kidney damage, but it works on the principle of reducing the creatinine, which may be probably less taxing on the kidney you can talk about. Then use of amino acids is the third issue, which people, a lot of people talk of. There is proteinuria, there is azotemia, there is uh, creaturia, there is already creatinine being elevated. Orally, when you give amino acid, you again broke it down and convert it into ammonia. But then how do we use them? Is it useful intravenously? How much of amino acid you're going to use to treat? Why we need to use amino acids? The criteria here is in cases of CKD, where there is proteinuria and results in hypoalbuminemia. So such hypoalbuminemia need to be treated. There have been sufficient documentation wherein you use these preparations orally over periods, and probably they can help in bringing down the hypoalbuminia levels to a minimum level where the longevity of the animal can be increased. And uh, the lot of preparations have been used. I'll give you some literature in the end later. Next, please. This is one of the composition of an amino acid per 100 gram. Think about that. Branched chain aliphatic amino acid, 26 grams. Aliphatic amino acid, 24 grams. Aromatic, 11 grams. Heterocyclic, 6 grams. Glucose as a carrier, 10 grams, sucrose, and pregenerated is rice. All these have been used as a source of protein orally to be given to the animals in proteinuric patients or hypoalbuminic patients. Now, let's come to the conclusion. What is that? We have talked for so many hours now. Let us have some take home. Early detection of kidney disease in dogs is very important. Amongst the biomarkers, HDMA quantitation is very promising. Let us deviate from bun and creatinine. If a person is available, please get HDMA done. Treatment involves limiting further damage and enhancing the cellular recovery. Treat the specific cause where applicable. Please do not use all kinds of antibiotic on uh, renal patients. The most effective therapy of AKA is careful management of fluid balance rather than all other complications. Treatment is most successful during induction and extension phases, and success diminishes once the latter phases have been reached. Whereas in case of uh, CKD, regardless of the underlying cause, CKD may be characterized as an irreversible and slowly progressive disease. No treatment can correct existing irreversible kidney lesion or CKD. Clinical and biochemical consequences of reduced kidney function can often be managed with supportive therapy. Nutritional management has to be given due importance and you need to think in terms of right to balance a diet as well as nutraceuticals, which also play a role in modifying the kidney function and they're quite beneficial in the long-term management of CKD. Next, please. With this, let me say thank you for all of you for your time that you have devoted and thank everyone for the patient hearing and thank the organizers and more specifically, Dr. Uh, uh, Bikanesar and Dr. Sunil Wagmare for giving me an opportunity to share my uh, experience and a little on the topic that we wanted to talk on kidney diseases. This has been a burning topic and everyone wants this to be talked on. Thank you very much. Thank you all for the patient hearing again. Uh, thank you very much, sir, uh, for such a wonderful scientific uh, elaborative presentation. Really, it was... Uh, Magnificent presentation. So there are a few questions, sir, in the yes. question and answer section. Yes. And uh, shall I take a few of them? Yeah. Oh, some yeah. other questions. Uh, please uh, tell commercial product names you mentioning. Which commercial products? I don't know. Copper toxicity in dogs. Yeah, copper toxicity produces hepatic toxicity. Let me not talk much on the liver diseases because I'm uh, concentrating much on this. Use of lactose like lactulose is justified in hepatic disorder. I don't know, from kidney, we are shifting it to hepatic disorder. Yes, in hepatic disorders, lactulose is used in hepatic disorders because it prevents ammonemia. You can use them. And uh, in other situations, no, let me not uh, talk too much on the hepatic disorder at this point of time. My discussion has been on more on 
kidney disorders. Okay, please uh, concentrate on kidney problem. Let us be very focused in our lecture. Okay, let us not get, jump from kidney disorder to hepatic disorder. Everything on hepatic, I don't know why. What about dietary management? Dietary management, I did talk about it. What you need is the protein. You need to balance the protein. You have the minimum requirement of the protein and use the protein source as a high biological protein. Don't mix up too much of chicken, too much of meat into that. You need to work on the minimum levels of protein required based on the body weight. Work on that protein levels. Use the high biological protein. High biological proteins are egg and then calculate the percentage and do not increase in levels like not more than 15 to 16%. That would be good on that. Side effects is there in Ayurvedic can help in this. When we talk of Ayurvedic treatment, I did not mention about Ayurvedic treatment. I talked about the herbal product. When I say herbal product, these are rhubarbs which can alter the kidney function. Not that, you know, I'm talking about Ayurvedic treatment. Obviously, Ayurvedic treatment do have complications in terms of uh, GI disturbances. So we need to be careful on that. Which antibiotic is used in hepatic and kidney disease? Specifically, again, I'll concentrate much onto the kidney because hepatic, somebody has already covered. What you need here is, why do you need an antibiotic in the kidney disease here? Yeah. You are very particular, leptospirosis, treat with penicillin or doxycycline. If it is pyelonephritis, it is a gram-negative organism and you can very well treat with endro, you know, any of the quinolones. Endrofloxacin is good enough onto that. You can use amoxiclavulonic acid Amoxy, these are good enough. You don't need a much complicated antibiotic in treatment of renal diseases because the infectious causes are very less in this. Is there a justification of using amino acid infusions? I don't know whether it is mentioned to liver or kidney disease. In kidney disease, I would say no. It is definitely not a good method on that. Definitely not a good method on that when you don't need the uh, amino acid infusion in kidney disorders, but they are definitely useful in liver disorders. Prednisolone dose should be decreased at what rate and in how many days of beginning? I think these are all questions more to the hepatic, I think, isn't it? The vitamin D growth promoting diet in, in used in pups. Be very careful on this. Yeah, all of you know very well what is the requirement of calcium, phosphorus, and vitamin D. Vitamin D, the recommended dosage is 25 to 40 units per kg. And the half-life of vitamin D3, we all know very well that it can be months. It is not just like this. So there are people who would use uh, 3 lakh units, 6 lakh units every week. And imagine for a puppy of the usual size, like Dobermans, at that year, they are about 10 to 12 kgs or 15 kgs. Great Danes, Rottweilers are around 15 to 25 kgs in that time. And what you need at 40, that is the minimum requirement. Whereas here you have a therapeutic requirement. You can consider... 10 times the maintenance dose as therapeutic dosage, and you can work out at 400 units per kg. 400 units per kg into 10 kgs, 15 kgs, 20 kgs. People use 3 lakh units every week. Why? This is the question, and obviously you work on that. Prednisolone, how long? Okay, I'm not going to answer on hepatic disorders. Please don't upset, okay? Significance of urine creatinine ratio in CKD and treatment for increase. This is not increased or decreased in that. This is what I talked about as a parameter to decide. And it can talk to you the stage of that. When you talk about this, it can talk to you on the protein ratio, which gives an indication there is hypoalbuminemia or not. If there is hypoalbuminemia, then you can go ahead with that. That's number one. Number two, these ratios are a good indicator of CKD. So direct your treatment towards CKD, meaning to say that what you need to do. If the animal is, the values are persistently high, put on to the fluid therapy. What is most important in CKD patient is if the animal is not eating, you can never bring the patient back to less than two. I'm 100% very sure about it. Any patient with the values from say 12 came back to five, four, two, Three, maintain that. If the animal is not eating, then go in for a fluid therapy. That's what it indicates to that. How to manage secondary renal hyperparathyroidism in dog? One of the methods is you use the calcitriol because there is treatment with this. Calcitriol is used in these patients and it can help to some extent. With that. How much it will cost for a cystatin C estimation? 
I have not seen a private laboratory doing it, but we were doing it in the college. And these are all, uh, all these are uh, ELISA kits being used and the estimation of that. And uh, a 10 test and a 25 test kit, we used to get it. And per sample, it will work out to be around 2,000, uh, roughly 2,000 to 2,000 rupees. Human laboratory, if you are using these kits, yes, it can be, the routine human lab cannot be done because the standards are different, but there are some human labs which now these days do it and you can do that. Biomarkers of these, particularly enzymes of these can be done routinely because you can get ALP, GGT, these are all, you take a urine sample and get it done and simultaneously you can calculate the ratio of them and you need to work on this. If you set up a laboratory, probably I can send you more details on that, how to get these done and you can do it. And you need to use them and interpret them rather just getting a value is not important. So it is always interpreted to the serum creatine. So get the, get the urine enzymes done along with the serum values and interpret them. Create, is reversal upon treatment possible creatine level greater than five? Let me tell you very specific, wonderful question for me because <clears throat> I've seen cases with 13, cases with 12, and some case, one case with 18. Treatment with, I consider them as CKD. Management of the fluid therapy, along with secondary complication treatment for anemia, secondary anemia with erythropoietin or dorbopoietin, treatment of excess of phosphorus because there is hyperphosphatemia with oral uh, phosphorus binders, supplemented with fluid therapy. I've come across cases which they have remained anything between four and five, uh, cases which have been lingering on for the past seven months, eight months. The moment they go off feed for uh, two, three days, we again put them on fluid therapy. It can come down. Again, it's a question of that. Not all cases you can interpret like that. So what is necessary here is we normally follow fluid therapy in these cases and monitor their creatinine values every 72 hours. And if the animal starts eating and they are stable, we leave at that. And the moment the animal goes off feed, again, we put them under treatment on that. Hypertension, I did talk about it. You can use AC inhibitors. AC inhibitors also play a role and aflatopine also play a role. I did mention about this. Ferrous sulfate is used for how many days? These are all related to blood values. Get your uh, hemoglobin and PCV done. And as long as there's an improvement is seen, you can use them. But the question here is, you know very well, certain of them, iron preparation, they produce nausea. Normally, you need to use them for weeks and months. And uh, if the values of RBCs and uh, hemoglobin and hemocrit is increasing, you can use for months together. There is no any kind of a hindrance on that. But people might say that uh, urine color, uh, sorry, the fecal material color will change. That's not an issue at all. n 16 having any role in the treatment of kidney, this is what I said. The mechanism it works is, it brings down the creatinine level. That's what it is talked of. But in terms of helping the kidney tissue, uh, I haven't come across any literature. I've reviewed a lot of them because there was a question in my earlier talk also about this. And, uh, it has been used, I would say, not as a very popular drug. People have been using it to reduce the creatinine levels while you are treating patients of CKD. Which antibiotic, same question is coming. Fluids, when I talked about it, fingers lactate and DNS. Or certain times DNS alone is good enough, but you should monitor your sodium values. Unless you monitor the sodium values, you cannot just think of sodium chloride. So you can use ring lactate combined with 25% ratio or two is to one ratio of DNS and RF. Plan, any Ayurvedic plant to use the plant, I'm really not sure about that, but we're using the commercial preparations. How to can differentiate AKD and CKD other than markers? Very good question from the practicing point of view. Use two parameters. Number one, acute kidney disease versus CKD. AKD is with hyperkalemia and high specific gravity, urine specific gravity higher. Is the number one, severe azotemia in cases of AKDs, whereas in case of CKD, hypokalemia or normal potassium levels and specific gravity of the urine is lower. Always you talk in terms of, you call hyposthenuria. Hyposthenuria is low specific gravity. Isosthenuria, stable at a point. 
it can be even either hypostenuric or isostenuric. Use this. This is a very good parameter. And probably you can use a TS meter for measuring the specific gravity in the urine. You don't need huge quantity of urine. One drop onto the TS meter can record the specific gravity. I'm telling you very frankly, I'm using it on a routine basis. We monitor the patient and then do with this. And not that we do after administering uh, glucose because glucose can alter the specific gravity. When you give the glucose intravenous, it is eliminated in the urine by the kidney because this is one good part about it. You talk in terms of uh, CKD with anuria, oliguria, or normal urination. Certainly very surprising sometimes. Commercial renal diet name you get from many companies. I think this being a general lecture, I don't want to name. There are many international companies as well as Indian companies which are manufacturing renal diet, both uh, dry food as well as semi-solid diet, good enough preparations. We do have oral preparations for enteral feeding. That means you can pass a stomach tube and uh, do it. Can pets maintained on uh, home nutrition rather than costly prescription diet in case of kidney disease? Theoretically, yes. Theoretically, yes. But problem is you cannot increase the palatability of the diet. You know very well that the moment you decrease the protein and fat in the diet, the palatability alters. So you find it very difficult. And maintaining the palatability of the diet is a big issue. Altering or maintaining a palatable diet for a dog is not very easy. That's one of the reasons why it's better to change out to the renal diet, not from the point of commercial company being promoted. Many people might think like that because I've been a practitioner for many years. And these commercial diets have been available to us probably in this decade. And I can say that a lot many patients on the renal diet are doing much better than the homemade diet. Not that you know it cannot be, you can. One question here, management of ARS induced by pyometra, provided we do not have a gas anesthesia. Very difficult, I think there are. I think this is a good question for a surgeon. Since I'm a general practitioner, we have a surgeon who would change the anesthetic for pyometra cases. We don't normally use uh, thiopentone. We don't use thiopentone because that is not a good there's not a good anesthetic for pyometra patients because there is a compromise already in that. You have different anesthetics being used in cases of pyometra. Unless you relieve this pyometra, I think treatment of ERA becomes very difficult. You can sustain them by fluid therapy, but it is because of a toxin. This toxin inserts the kidney. You need to be very much worried about it. Ascites due to CKD, lot for ascites. What is it? CKD can produce ascites. And in these conditions, always, this is because of hypertension invariably. So use uh, AC inhibitors like enalapril, benazapril, they are good. You could also use the ferrosamide combinations as well. Diuretics, along with uh, AC inhibitors, use the diuretic as well. You can use uh, ferrosamide, but uh, you could also use the benazapril because this is both, uh, it works as a diuretic as well. It's a potassium sparing uh, AC inhibitor. You get good amount of preparations on this. You can use that. Prescription diet trade names people have been asking. As I said, maybe I'll not give the list of them. Treat urine incontinence. Okay, the question is wonderful. Urinary incontinence could be because of so many. Number one, urinary incontinence could have been produced, which you call it as a leaky vagina or a leaky penis, sometimes being talked of. If uh, surgery, uh, neutering has been done at a very early age, less than six months, you need to go in for hormone treatment there. In other situations, if there's a urinary incontinence, you should start suspecting the bladder infection. You should also start suspecting probably calculi. It could be calculi in the bladder and incontinence occurs because these stones move and they come and block the sphincter. There is a pressure, they come and some amount of urine is passed, they make that. Or there can be calculi even in the urethra. So you need to think about the calculi. It could be because of a surgery, post-surgery after neutering. And rarely it could be because of infection, urethritis, particularly can cause urinary incontinence. A lot of pain as well. Urethritis is very common. In case of female dogs, vaginitis could also cause urinary incontinence. So diagnose and treat them as primary causes of that. Can LLAP will be used to increase GFR? It is not a situation to increase the GFR. These are not aimed toward that. These are all aimed toward decreasing the blood the pressure 
blood pressure. So in turn, it can help to some extent. What practices do you suggest to pet owners to avoid or minimize renal diseases in the first place? First and the foremost, vaccinate your dogs because leptospira is one of the common thing. The second thing being tick control because of late, you know very well, Ehrlichia and Babesia both have been manifested as a renal problem. So tick control, management of Ehrlichia and Babesia is the second major thing I would talk about. The third being, lot many people use analgesics, anti-inflammatory drugs without any kind of a prescription. Without any prescription. I've seen people using for weeks and weeks together. Antibiotic without prescription being used by people. Thinking that, you know, the moment they get a temperature, they are on all kinds of antibiotics. Indiscriminately do not use anti-inflammatory drugs as well as antibiotics. I think that's another thing. And dietary, when we talk of avoid all these compounds which are supposed to produce any kind of a kidney damage. It is said, resins and grapes better avoid in the adult dog itself, right from the puppyhood. It's not a good vegetable for us. It's not a fruit, not a must that we should add up. So it can minimize. And then keep a, keep a watch. Keep a watch on the animal's uh, behavior, urination process. And if the animal uh, is showing any kind of uh, manifestation of a renal disorder, as we mentioned earlier, get it tested as quickly as possible. Do not allow the animal to get into a situation of CKD is more important. Dietary factors, when you talk of, it's a myth that high protein will uh, increase the renal disease. No, it's a myth. It's not like that. But in patients or renal patients, you should uh, lessen the burden on the kidney, but not that, you know, protein supplementation, high protein is going to matter for a kidney disease. Definitely not. And if there any kind of, any kind of uh, disease process, if the animal is not eating, need to consult a vet. Fluid therapy is a must because if there is no if there's hypovolemia, it can cause kidney damage. Any kind of septic sepsis, abscess particularly, imagine. The animal is not eating for a few days. They will say, no, 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 he drank water. But imagine the insult to the kidney cost. Insult to the kidney because of toxemia. So any animal not eating for a few days, if there's a hypovolemia, any dehydration, mm -hmm. it has to be addressed. That's what some of the practices I would suggest for owner, the doctors to tell the owners to minimize the renal disease. I have another one interesting question. Explain the terminology. This is ADMA, symmetric dimethyl arginine. Symmetric, earlier was ADMA, asymmetric dimethyl arginine. It is an amino acid synthesized there and a minimal inflammatory response, it mm -hmm. increases. That's the reason why the moment the tubular function changes occur, ADMA gets elevated. This is the symmetric dimethyl arginine and quantitation of this is very, very good, I would say. Let us know if samples for SDMA can be sent for human laboratory. I have not got it done from any human laboratory as of today. And uh, you have a procedure which can be done in the laboratory if you set up a laboratory, but a practitioner, it might be difficult to keep the standards and work on all that. And uh, maybe now the instruments are available and uh, SDMA kits are available. We can get it done. If auxiliary crystals are found in the urine analysis, only fluid therapy can help. Yes, fluid intake is good enough unto that and dissolve them, any kind of auxiliary crystals. Also check out the pH of the urine, and you know very well that these uh, favor, and if the urine is acidic, turn towards the alkalinity, or alkaline many a times, or the, if you are very, very specific about this, you know the oxalic acid, auxiliary crystals are of oxalic acid, and the steroids are more common than the oxalate. Cysteine is again more common. The uh, disadvantage of cysteine crystals are, uh, they are radiolucent, and uh, you don't find them. Okay, rather radio-opaque, rather and you don't find them in the x-rays many a times. Fluid used in kidney disease and what ratio? I did mention about it. Ringer's lactate in treatment of acidosis and metabolic acidosis when you have. Otherwise, combination of Ringer's lactate and DNS is a good choice for fluid therapy. What are the examples of high biological protein products? Egg is one of the most high biological value protein. And you can think about that. That's a good protein. You could also derive some amount of protein by the vegetable source. That's also another good thing to work on that. How accurate is the GGT estimation as a kidney marker? 
these are all, when you talk about these, these are better than the creatine and bun. You need to get them done together. And only thing is they are very specific for a particular area of the functioning and you can get it done. When I talk about the GGT, this is the GGT in urine. You do not get the GGT of uh, the serum samples. You need to get the urine GGT done. That's, that's the reason why specifically I gave you the values of the urinary enzymes. These are called urinary enzymes. Do not consider them as a biochemical parameter here. All the enzymes I talked about as urinary enzyme, that means you need to get them quantitated in the urine sample. What are the indication of albumin globulin ratio difference? I think I mentioned in my talk itself, I gave you albumin globulin ratios. You don't go by in this because they are more important for globulin. When you talk of, when you say any condition, it is considered anything above 0 0.7, 0 0.8 to 1, 1 1.4 is ideal. Anything less than 0 0.8, 8 is considered as age ratios as abnormal. So here you use them as more of supplementation, hepatic disorders and cardiac disorders. And in case of this, if there's an alteration, there's a more of a globulin, it indicates an infection. If it is less of the globulin, then albumin is high, then you have very many conditions where hyperalbuminia would have occurred. Many of them, tumors, cancer tissue, et cetera, et cetera. I think I've uh, taken a number of questions of them. Uh, any specific questions remaining?